We're on. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm Richard Haas, uh, president here. And today's event is the third in our relatively new What to Do About series, uh, in which experts uh, basically discuss a uh, difficult and often controversial policy issue, and then uh, not just analyze it, but also make some uh, prescriptions uh, about what the United States uh, could do. And the way we structure it is something along the lines of a mock NSC meeting, except no one here is representing an agency, but all three of these individuals is essentially here as uh, what in a different generation was called a wise man, uh, a counselor to the president, and simply giving uh, what he believes uh, to be uh, the right position apart from any uh, bureaucratic or, or organizational uh, bias. Uh, we're extraordinarily lucky today because we have three individuals uh, who have uh, thought hard about the hard issue that is the subject of today's meeting, which is what to do about uh, Guantanamo. Uh, to my uh, immediate left here is uh, Philip Carter who is now a senior fellow at CNAS, the Center for New American Security, and in his previous life was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense overseeing uh, detainee policy. Uh, sitting uh, next to uh, Mr. Carter is Mark Thiessen, and Mark is a senior, uh, is a fellow at the uh, AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, and he was formerly uh, chief speechwriter to 43, uh, George W. Bush. And uh, last but not least is Matt Waxman. Matt is a professor at a, new, uh, a young university up the road called Columbia <laughs> at the uh, law school. And he's also uh, an adjunct senior fellow here uh, at, the, at the Council on, on Foreign Relations. Let me just say uh, a few things just to set the stage, just to make sure that everybody is basically up to date on some of the, uh, some of the statistics before we, we get into the analysis and, again, policy prescription. Uh, Guantanamo, as a, as a facility, was opened in 2002, the year after 9-11. Uh, and some 800 or so uh, detainees have been taken there over, over essentially the decade plus uh, since that time. Most were at one point or another uh, transferred or released. And most of this took place during the latter part of, uh, of the Bush uh, presidency. It's now, here we are in the spring of of 2014. It's now more than five years since President Obama assumed office and since he announced his intention to close the, the facility, uh, the prison at, at Guantanamo. And no one has been sent to Guantanamo during this entire time. So the, the, the population as a result has come down. Uh, as a result of no incoming and lots of people being uh, released or transferred. And now approximately, I think it's just over 150 prisoners uh, remain at the camp. Uh, the majority of those, or, or significant plurality of those who are there are from Yemen, and there are others from such countries as Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia. Roughly about half the people at Guantanamo the number I have is 77. I'm sure I will be corrected uh, if I'm wrong. Of the, of the detainees have been cleared for release, but they remain behind bars because there's no country to which the United States can, under the existing law, uh, send them. And Yemen is a particular problem in this uh, regard. Uh, Congress uh, has passed legislation. What was that year? that Congress passed? Each year. Oh, each year, okay. In that case, I should have just chosen a year and I would have been right. Uh, <laughs> Congress has passed legislation that prohibits the transfer of former detainees to the United States. 
and has put uh, in place fairly uh, tight and demanding conditions that need to be met before they can be transferred uh, overseas. So that's essentially the, the situation. And so let me, let me turn to something I've been thinking about. Uh, when, the pres when this president, when Barack Obama made his announcement that uh, it was a goal of this administration, of his, at that point, just beginning administration, to uh, shut down Guantanamo, uh, both implicit and I believe explicit in what he said was that the United States was paying a significant price, reputationally, diplomatically, uh, and in some ways even in the security realm because it was seen as something of a motivator for the fact wa that Guantanamo was a, an open and a, and a going concern. So one of my questions is whether that was true or not then. Is it true today? Uh, is Guantanamo still something of a, a recruiting tool uh, that it was alleged to have been five years ago? Does, is it, does basically, is the fact that it is, remains open, is it something that is uh, that is still of high profile? And it is, is it something that is still a uh, significant motivator of anti-American sentiment and, and behavior? I have, you know, we can just go across the room. Uh, Phil, you want to start with that? Sure. I mean, the strategic costs of Guantanamo have been the large driver in this, much more than the half a billion dollars we spend each year to keep the facility open. Um, in terms of catalyzing actual radicalization, that is still an open question. We don't have a randomized control trial that tells us that with Guantanamo it's uh, likely to generate terrorism, without it it's not. Um, what we do see though uh, are issues with allies that arise because of Guantanamo. We saw this most clearly in a recent case of a rendition to federal court here in New York where the Italian government and their intelligence services cooperated with the U.S. government in part because they knew that transfer would take place to Manhattan and not to Guantanamo. Um, we see this in other liaison relationships with other allies, particularly those of Europe that are more sensitive to these issues and would prefer to work with our law enforcement and intelligence agencies and not with the Department of Defense. So I still think there are some strategic costs to keeping it open and using that as the preferred venue for detention. Mark, uh, let me ask you the same question, but also let me push. Wouldn't we know a little bit just by, for example, mentions of Guantanamo? Wouldn't we pick up certain if not statistical measures, wouldn't there still be a pretty good sense from debris, from just what we would pick up, that uh, if one simply did a quantitative analysis of mentions uh, now as opposed to five or ten years ago, would, wouldn't that tell us at least indirectly, if not absolutely, about the uh, salience of this issue? It would help, sure. Um, and if you talk to uh the people who, uh, who uh, follow these things in the intelligence community, they'll tell you that it's not a primary recruiting tool that the terrorists even try to use. Um, but I would argue, quite frankly, I reject the notion entirely that Guantanamo is a, is a recruiting tool for terrorism. And let me put it to you this way. Uh, there was no Guantanamo Bay in 1998 when they blew up our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. There was no Guantanamo Bay when Al-Qaeda blew up the USS Coal in 2000. And there was no Guantanamo Bay on September 11, 2001 when the terrorists attacked us here in New York City. Uh, they didn't need Guantanamo Bay to recruit uh, terrorists to carry out those attacks. And I've spent a lot of time talking to interrogators, the people who actually sit face to face the way we're talking uh, with KSM, with, uh, with, uh, with these senior al-Qaeda leaders. And what they will tell you that what succeeds, what helped them recruit terrorists is successful terrorist attacks. What helped them carry out 9-11 was the fact that for a decade we had a series of escalating attacks uh, and were unable to stop them and didn't seem to have the will or the capability of preventing them. And that is what recruited more people to come and join the ranks of al-Qaeda. So to the extent that Guantanamo Bay uh, has been helpful in producing intelligence that stopped us, stopped follow-on terrorist attacks, it's actually been a net plus, not a net, a net loss for us in terms of the battle against terror. Matt, you want to weigh in on this? Or? Yeah, I, I'd say that um, you know my my best assessment based on what what I've seen is that uh, the continued existence of Guantanamo plays some marginal role as a propaganda tool, uh, but it's I, I haven't seen uh, uh, very persuasive indications that if we were to 
uh, uh, solve the Guantanamo problem, we would make a big dent in violent radicalization. And I think the main reason for that is that to the extent that Guantanamo does show up in a list of grievances that contribute to violent radicalization, that's a really long list of grievances. Um, and uh, Guantanamo may be at the top, but there are plenty of others, drone strikes, support for Israel, et cetera. Uh, I, 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 if you take Guantanamo off the table, I, again, I'm not sure you make a, a big dent on, on the propaganda recruitment side. I do agree with, with Phil that uh, from a, a national security standpoint, I think the most important costs of maintaining Guantanamo are not uh, the recruitment slash propaganda problem, but uh, uh, friction in our uh, bilateral cooperation in counterterrorism operations with our allies. Uh, uh, our, our allies are reluctant, for example. When you say allies, could be more, is it mainly European allies? As mainly to European Eastern ma allies? I, I'm, I'm talking primarily about our European allies because they, they tend to be the most sensitive to it and also, in some cases, um, a worry about their own legal liability under European law if they were to cooperate with us in certain counterterrorism practices. Guantanamo among them. So I, I think uh, I, I, the operation of Guantanamo has, for example, made what used to be very routine uh, uh, law enforcement cooperation in counterterrorism operations more difficult with the Europeans. There's also an opportunity cost. We continue, we certainly did during the Bush administration, I think we continue to spend a lot of diplomatic capital uh, uh, arguing about Guantanamo and what to do about it instead of working with coalition partners uh, on other more productive aspects of combating terrorism. Let me just follow up then on, on so I understand it. What is at the, the center of the European objections then to Guantanamo? What is, is, is it a, a legal argument? It is, is it a functional argument that it's not effective? Is it a uh, moral argument? What, what, what is the, the, the case, if you will, against it? So the central argument is born of a disagreement that this is not an armed conflict. And therefore, the very idea of the tension pursuant to the laws of armed conflict at Guantanamo is illegitimate. That's the core disagreement. And it plays out at Guantanamo, it plays out on the battlefield of Afghanistan, where our troops have had to have different rules of engagement with uh, uh, than their allies on the battlefield. And it plays out in the counterterrorism context as well, where they would prefer a law enforcement-centric approach. And just, just so I understand, that, they, so they're, they're, this opposition or is, is grounded in an, a, essentially then in an international legal position that this doesn't check that box and therefore you can't. Yeah, and, and there's a whole second set of concerns relating to detainee treatment and interrogation. And I should probably yeah. defer to Mark who's written a lot more on this, but there's a fundamental objection to both perception and reality there, which has probably been more apparent publicly, but it's this legal argument that is the most solid, it's the one advanced most in bilateral discussions of the type that Matt's been discussing. Yeah, I, I agree that that's the fundamental issue is, is, are we engaged in a war or are we engaged in a law enforcement operation? Uh, you know, you keep hearing the objection to Guantanamo is, well, how can you keep people, hold people indefinitely if they haven't had a chance to write to a trial and, and haven't been convicted of a crime? And the answer is they're, they're enemy combatants. They're not criminals. Um, I'm, in, in a few months, I'm taking my 87-year-old mother to Poland. Uh, to, uh, for the uh, uh, Warsaw, uh, the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising. She was a young soldier at 16 years old who fought uh, with, against the Nazis. She was captured, taken to uh, Germany, and was a prisoner of war. And under international law, I don't recall that she ever had a lawyer who was able to challenge her detention. Uh, there is no right to challenge your detention under, for, for enemy combatants in international law. So actually, al-Qaeda terrorists have rights uh, that my mother, as a prisoner of the, of the Nazi regime, didn't have. Um, the, but it, the fact that they could hold her was completely accepted. Uh, you can hold enemy combatants through the du through duration of the war. So to the extent that we have indefinite detention, the indefinite part of it is decided by al-Qaeda. Uh, last I checked, they did, there's no signing ceremony on the deck of the USS Missouri where they've, where they've surrendered to us. And far from surrendered to us, they are, you know, they just, there was just a video released uh, a week ago in Yemen of them uh, having an open air rally, completely unafraid of a drone strike. Uh, where the second in command of Al Qaeda urged them to attack the United States, uh, so they're not surrendering anytime soon. As long as they're not willing to surrender, we have the right to, to detain uh, their their captured enemy combatants uh, for the course of the conflict. We have a 
What, though, how does one defend the practice of defend, detention without trial? I could see where collectively you could say it's naive to think that the struggle or conflict or war with al-Qaeda uh, is over. But then you still have individual cases. And since you haven't have a trial, what is the legal and moral justification for holding indefinitely an indi individual without trial? Isn't there, at least in principle, the possibility that this individual is being uh, wrongly held, and that how does one therefore justify, uh, again, if you will, open-ended detention without trial? You're asking me? Well, the, I think, uh, yeah. Well, so, so I, I mean, I, I do think first, Happy first of all, I would, I, I would, I would add, you know, I, I do think there, uh, uh, many of our uh, 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 allies have a legal objection. I think they also, in many cases, have a, 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 a moral and, and strategic objection. Though I have found that there's often a difference between where public opinion is, let's say, in Western Europe and the kind of message that we receive privately from uh, uh, leadership in those states where I think they actually kind of like the issue to, to, to go away. It, th it doesn't cause the same degree of friction that it did during the, during, during the Bush years. I, I, I do uh, I actually agree uh, uh, with this idea that um, as a legal matter, uh, uh, it's a very reasonable argument to say we are in an armed conflict, a war with Al Qaeda, and therefore ought to be able to uh, uh, detain, capture, detain, and hold for the duration of hostilities those enemy fighters as in other wars. And by the way, this is an argument now that all three branches and both parties, in, leadership in this country, have bought into. It's also, though, an argument on, uh, uh, on which out, whether no matter how persuaded we are, um, many of our allies are not. And I think, Richard, you've touched on a couple of the reasons why they are unpersuaded by this. I think one reason is um, that uh, uh, this idea of misidentification, that uh, 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 in a conventional war, the United States against the German army, not in every case, but in most cases, there would be clear indicia of who is or is not an enemy fighter, and we didn't worry about false positives as much when it came to, to, to detaining for the duration of hostilities. I think the other issue is one of duration, that uh, uh, it is true that many conventional wars go on for a very long period of time, and we don't know during the course of those wars when they're going to, to come to an end, but I think the likelihood that the conflict with Al Qaeda has uh, uh, no foreseeable endpoint, uh, uh, at which time there would be a traditional exchange of prisoners. I think that's another reason why this idea of uh, uh, treating enemy fighters as belligerents who can be held without trial till the end of the conflict. I think that's one reason why it's very unsettling uh, 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 to many of our partners around the world. I'm, I'm, mindful, I'm actually going to jump in here because I'm mindful of the time. So I, I want to get on the table some prescriptive issues, okay? So let me jam ahead here a little bit. Uh, what about the, uh, let's look at some of the options, and I've got at least five or six, as opposed to simply the status quo, or shutting Guantanamo down, or if you will, reopening it to new people. Seems to me you've got three things that are kind of Guantanamo specific. Uh, but let's, beyond those, I can think of a few others. What about the idea of um, trying them in the United States, either in civilian or, or military courts? Well, what, what, what should we think of that, that option? It's a well-worn path that's been used for hundreds of terrorism detainees in the federal court system. Uh, you currently have two or three times more terrorism incarcerated detainees or convicts at this point in Florence, Colorado and Terre Haute, Indiana than you have at Guantanamo. Uh, federal courts here in Manhattan and Brooklyn and elsewhere do a fantastic job with this. The problem is that it does reflect a shift, a, a, a normative shift in U.S. policy that you would have to acknowledge, which is away from a wartime tool that's appropriate for war and for detainees of this type to more of a law enforcement model. 
Um, I think it's the right way to go. I think you get to put them into the civilian to put them into a federal. You, you get more convictions, longer sentences, better intelligence cooperation because of the plea bargain and other mechanisms in the civil civilian system, and you avoid the catastrophe that military commissions has become, which has been on display in the New York Times this weekend, which is. It's simply a new process that cannot work as designed. It could be a good process, it could be a good system, but it is not working. And we'd be fools to not use this incredible hundreds year old system that we have in our civilian justice. And is there anything, before I ask others what they think, is there anything in our law or anywhere else that would preclude, is it a matter of policy or law that this is not the practice, i.e. trying people in, in civil courts criminal, you know, if you will, on the federal courts rather, and then if they're found guilty, then putting, sentencing them and incarcerating them in, in federal prisons. Is there, what, what precludes that option from happening? There's an idea in international law that if you're a combatant on the battlefield, you have immunity from uh, those acts that you commit on the battlefield. But, you know, as Mark has said, these are unprivileged belligerents. These are folks that break the laws of armed conflict. And the traditional response is to try them according to domestic law with all the rights and protections thereof. Um, there is nothing in our law that would preclude us from this option except for the statute that Congress has passed. This is in some ways... The, the statute, just like, pardon my ignorance, the statute that Congress has passed precludes taking people through the federal court system or, or incarcerating them in federal... Uh, bringing them to the states for prosecution in the federal system. But this is an inherently presidential thing. This is the very essence of prosecutorial discretion. What system do I want to use? What charges do I want to bring? This is the very essence of our president's power. And uh, I believe that it's something that he could do if he wanted to. Last question, I'll open up the others. Uh, would this... Um, if the United States were to put this approach into practice, would this take care of... Uh, most or all of the European objections? Yes. Mark? Um, number one, the reason you use uh, military commissions versus civilian courts is because uh, the, the way that you capture these people is different than if a police officer busted down a drug, a drug uh, kingpin's house in Manhattan. When our special forces bust down doors in, in Karachi or in Afghanistan, uh, they don't secure the perimeter with police tape. They don't have chain of custody for the evidence. They are trying to get intelligence and exploit it as quickly as possible to turn it around for, for an, another military raid to get other guys before uh, trying to get inside the information cycle of the enemy so that you can exploit the intelligence before the word has gotten back to others that they've been captured and that they're, that they're vulnerable. So we don't, want to put a, we don't want to put our special forces and our troops in a position where they have to act like New York City police officers rather than special operations forces trying to kill, a, a kill or capture an enemy in, in, in a time of war. So if that's the case, then you need a uh, different type of legal system that allows for fair trials, uh, but also takes into account the realities of the battlefield. This is not a criminal. Uh, this is not. This is not a criminal raid. It's a military raid in which most of these people are captured in. But second, I, I think it's the. If you, if you forgive me, the wrong question, which is I'm not terribly concerned, at least in a primary sense, with how we dispose of the people we have. The the primary concern we should have with Guantanamo and generally in the war on terror is. Uh, is, and this is, gets to the bottom of the legal, the law enforcement versus intelligence uh, paradigm, war paradigm, is that we should, be get, we should be focused on getting intelligence to stop the enemy from attacking us. And so we're, we spend a lot of time worrying about how we're going to try them, what system we're going to do. We're not getting intelligence today in the way we were in, in the past. I mean, if you, if you think about it, R Richard, there was, a, there was in the, I think everybody saw in the papers about a week ago, there were picture satellite photos of 40,000 Russian troops massing on the Ukrainian border. And we could tell, using that, int that intelligence, that Russia may have been preparing to, to send in forces into Ukraine. When your enemy is 19 guys with box cutters who infiltrate a free society, hide among us and play without wearing uniforms, uh, and go and hijack planes and fly them into buildings, satellite images don't help you. you can't, they don't have armies, navies, and air forces. So how do you get intelligence to stop terrorist attacks? And the answer is, the only way to get the intelligence is to have the terrorists tell you what their plans are. There are three ways to do that, three, there are the three eyes. There's infiltration, interrogation, and interception. So you can, you can uh, infiltrate Al-Qaeda, send double operatives in and try and get them to, to trust you and, and, and give you information. And we've done that with some success. We've had backfires like we did uh, in Afghanistan when, they, when a double agent blew up a CIA base. Um, but, but so, so that's, it's very hard. Al-Qaeda is a tribal 
uh, uh, ethnic uh, organization that is very distrustful of outsiders, very hard to infiltrate. Uh, second is interception. Uh, the Snowden uh, revelations have decimated our ability to intercept terrorist communications. Perfect example, New York Times report uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, exposed the fact that we had developed a system to break into computers that were not connected to the internet. They, so the terrorists believed that if they were not in, in, in the grid, we could monitor their communications, and we had actually figured out a way to do that. Uh, and that was exposed. And so the reaction of the terrorists is, well, we're not going to use those computers anymore. So we are giving the enemy information on how to avoid interception. So interception is not gone, but it's compromised. So the last thing is interrogation. You've got to get them to sit down and tell you uh, the what their plans are. And actually, in, even if you have interception and uh, infiltration, you still need interrogation because interception is by nature a passive activity. You're listening into the conversation and hoping that the terrorists tell you something useful. Interrogation is interactive. Uh, you can ask them questions. You can present intelligence to them uh, and get them to react to it. You can take something that one detainee said and use it to, to, to get another one to tell you information. And also, you can find out uh, they speak when, they're, when you have interception, they're speaking in code because they know we're listening. What are the code words? What are the voices on phone calls? We used to play uh, phone calls uh, for KSM uh, of, uh, of intercepted communications, and he would tell us who the voices in the phone calls are <coughs> and what the code words were. We've completely lost that capability. We do, not we, we do not interrogate terrorists anymore, period, full stop, at least high value terrorists. We've stopped doing it. We kill them with drones, uh, which is fine as it goes because you're taking bad people off the, off the, uh, off the grid, uh, but when you vaporize a terrorist with a drone, you vaporize all the intelligence in his brain. You vaporize all of the pocket litter that he has. Um, so we need to find a way to start interrogating people again and get information. I'd say, um, uh, Criminal prosecution in civilian courts absolutely should be an option that the president has at his disposal. I think it was a terrible mistake for Congress to close off that, op that option as a tool for dealing with some of the detainees at Guantanamo. There's no good- Just so I understand, was the, and was the principal reason that we didn't want to have convicted people sitting in Kansas, or was the principal reason that we were worried they couldn't get convicted given the protections we provide under U.S. law? It's more the first, because there was never any discussion by, uh, that, and I was going to get to this in a moment, that criminal prosecution would be the only avenue, the only tool that we would use for incapacitating, detaining uh, 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 terrorism suspects or Guantanamo detainees. I think the objections were really twofold. One was a, a, a security concern uh, slash not in my backyard problem of moving them into, into uh, 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 the United States. I think another is uh, what, what I think is a misguided argument that one m must make a choice that we are either engaged in a war against Al Qaeda or we are reliant only on law enforcement tools. And I don't think there's a good legal argument, moral policy, strategic argument, why you can't use both simultaneously. And by the way, that's what the George W. Bush administration did. Uh, it's often forgotten, I think, by members of Congress who seek to close off criminal prosecutions that the Bush administration brought uh, uh, Zacharias Massawi, the uh, alleged 20th hijacker, uh, uh, the shoe, uh, the, uh, 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 Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. The, the Bush administration used criminal prosecutions as a, a, a tool. Uh, I don't agree that, uh, or don't believe that uh, criminal prosecution is uh, 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 exclusive of intelligence gathering. I think in the right circumstances, criminal prosecution, criminal investigation often yields tremendous amounts of information uh, because you can interrogate uh, 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 criminal suspects and often criminal suspects uh, are turned. Um, uh, uh, the, the last point I'd make, though, is in defending criminal prosecutions as a tool, it has been a mistake among some proponents of closing Guantanamo that you could deal with all of the very dangerous detainees at Guantanamo simply by moving them into the uh, 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 criminal justice system. The Obama administration, like the Bush administration, looked at that and found that there were many cases, dozens of cases at Guantanamo that probably could not be successfully prosecuted 
notwithstanding the very, very, very high likelihood that these are extremely dangerous uh, 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 terrorists who would very eagerly return to the fight. So what, in those cases, if for whatever reason you determine that individual X could not be successfully prosecuted, either because of the nature of the evidence or how it was gathered, what, what, what have you, in your thinking then, what, what other approaches ought to be there? It's almost like you're, you're suggesting a kind of a la carte approach. One approach ought to be criminal. What, what else is on your, is on your menu? Uh, I, I would put on, on my, well, to, to start, um, uh, and as, as Mark said, you know, one, one important thing to, to keep in mind is we're, we've mostly been talking about options for dealing with somebody who's in our custody, and, 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 and that's one question we need to confront. Should we be taking custody of these people to begin with? Two of the alternatives, one is, is killing through, through targeted killing, another is uh, uh, detention or prosecution by third parties, other countries. Uh, 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 if somebody is in our custody, uh, uh, the, there have really been th at least three main tools that have been tried over the last couple of years. One is criminal prosecutions. I, I think that should be a tool. Uh, uh, another is continued detention under the laws of war. Uh, 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 and then the question is, what kinds of review procedures uh, uh, and uh, 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 protections should somebody be given if he's not going to receive any trial at all? And then the third possibility that we haven't talked too much about is military commissions, military trials. My own view of military commissions is and where that, would where, and where would those oh th those at least to date have been uh, uh, conducted at Guantanamo with the idea being that the trial the military trial would be done at Guantanamo and if convicted an individual would probably serve out the sentence at Guantanamo or perhaps some other arrangement negotiated with a, a home country. Okay. In my view, military commissions are uh, 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 a, 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 do have a historical validity in American law, in international law. Uh, 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 I think as currently constituted by Congress and the Bush administration, I'm mean, sorry, the, the Obama administration, military commissions are legal as a matter of domestic law and international law. I, my biggest worry is that to date, they've uh, been very, very difficult to get off the ground. We're talking about really establishing a new kind of trial system. And there's been some improvement, but we, we have found it very, very difficult to get cases from uh, 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 the beginning to an end state. Let me just introduce one last set of things, which is the overseas options. And it seems to me it applies both to people at Guantanamo or people not there. You could, you could say for those who are already at Guantanamo, the 150 or so individuals there, just basically sending them either to their country of origin or to the country where a crime was uh, allegedly committed. So you got those options. And then if we capture someone overseas, then it's again those options. Rather than bringing him, him or her to Guantanamo, it would mean uh, sending them back to either the country of origin or citizenship or the, the locale where the crime was committed. Uh, how much should, should that set of options, if you will, the, the overseas options, to what extent ought those to consider prominently? And after this, I'm going to open it up to our, our members. They're fraught. Um, very few allies have perfectly aligned interests with ours. Um, very few countries have the apparatus in place to deal with detainees of this type and do so in a way that's conducive to our interests. There was a lot of attention given a few years ago to the Saudi rehabilitation model. Uh, the Saudi Arabian government brings in detainees from their criminal justice system, furloughs them with an intense system of parole within their social context. It actually works reasonably well, but within that social context. I'm skeptical that it could work for other detainees. I'm skeptical it could be grafted to Yemen and made to work there. Uh, and other similar projects don't seem to have that good of a track record. So we're really left with an imperfect option working with these allies and other liaison services, particularly when many of these countries are unwilling to really drop the hammer and put these people in detention for what might be a lifetime. Um, I agree with that. Uh, the, uh, 
the number two uh, leader of al-Qaeda in Yemen, which is the terrorist network that probably threatens us the most, is a not only a Guantanamo uh, alumnus, but a graduate of that Saudi uh, program, rehabilitation so he an advanced program. degree. He's an advanced degree, exactly. <laughs> so um, we've, we've released a lot of bad people in the process of bending over backwards to try and, uh, to try and make sure that there are no goat herders still stuck in Guantanamo Bay. With the, there weren't very many to begin with. Um, but now that we're down to this 150 or so, I mean, we're dealing with the, with, with the exception of a few, the Uyghurs and a few other people, we're dealing with the worst of the worst. So this is the hardcore. Uh, these, are, these are the hardcore. These are people who, when, I mean, they, they on a regular basis, on a daily basis, attack their guards uh, with cocktails of, of feces and urine and the rest. Uh, where they, they chant uh, at them and sing uh, songs extolling Osama bin Laden and the 9-11 attacks. These are people who, if they had a chance to meet you, they would slit your throat without two seconds warning. Um, they, they, these, are, these are very, very bad people. Um, and so the idea of releasing more of these people, especially when the recidivism rate of the people we've already released is, is reaching between those who we know and those who we strongly suspect have returned to the fight is about 27% and growing. Uh, you release some of these people, it's going to go just even higher. Just I understand when you sort of talk about this alumnus who's going on, going on to do uh, bad things. This individual is released and went through the legal or yeah. rehabilitation, quote unquote, processes, yeah. and essentially then uh, released by the Bush administration. So we 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 in the Bush administration what released it. Might have, might have been Matt's fault. Uh, <laughs> so we have uh, we've released some really bad people back uh, back to the fight, and there are people, who, and and even some of the most uh, you know the most celebrated cases by the left. I mean, Mozambique, uh, who was a Guantanamo detainee, a British citizen, was finally released back, became this big campaigner against Guantanamo Bay. Just a few weeks ago, he was arrested on terrorism charges uh, for helping Al Qaeda in Syria. Um, so, you know, even some of these most celebrated people who are these victims who made all sorts of allegations, uh, false allegations of torture in Guantanamo, uh, are, are back out there. Uh, so, you know, the, the, it, that's a problem. Now you get the last word, then I want to open it up. Yeah, I would just, I would just add, I, I did work when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs. I did work on uh, uh, processes for reviewing uh, uh, detainees for possible release or transfer to, to other uh, 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 countries, and I would say that during the Bush years, when most of the Guantanamo detainees were released or transferred, there were errors in both directions. I think there were individuals who were captured and detained who shouldn't have been, and there were people who were released who or transferred who shouldn't have been. I also agree that there have been uh, the, the record is mixed in working with home countries or third countries to develop systems into which they could be securely placed. It's notable that many of the remaining detainees at Guantanamo are, are, are Yemeni, and we've for years had a difficult time because of the, the, the civil war in Yemen and difficulty in obtaining the kind of cooperation from the Yemeni government. Uh, uh, we've had a hard time figuring out a, a good, a good uh, a, 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 a solution for them. I would just note, just one, one last, just quick point is during the Bush administration, uh, uh, it was understood by the senior leadership that there was some risk in releasing or transferring detainees, but there was all there were. That, that's in part because there were costs, and not just moral costs to holding people, uh, but also costs to our foreign policy and our counterterrorism policy. The reason, one reason why I think some very dangerous people were released back to the UK was because our closest ally, the British government and uh, Bush's closest ally, uh, uh, Prime Minister Blair, had a huge domestic political challenge because we were holding uh, 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 British nationals. It was a major point of friction that occupied, not, the, the case of nine detainees occupied way more attention at the head of state level than it ever should have. Just to understand though, our concerns about releasing individuals to foreign countries is the, the inference that should be drawn that we're worried that they're too lenient and or too many people who are guilty end up on the loose again? Or is there concern from the other side that some of these governments will be, if you will, quote unquote, too rough, there, there'll be human rights abuses, that both. if both. Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah, both. Yeah, it's both. Okay. Okay. both. Just, yeah. just want to understand. Okay. And a, uh, third, and a third one, which is that to the extent that you're talking about captures of new people, 
is that they're not as effective in interrogating them as we are. That we, one of the things we did after 9-11 after was we realized that in the Clinton administration there had been a policy of extraordinary rendition, outbound rendition, where people would be captured and sent to, uh, the, uh, to the intelligence services of foreign countries who would interrogate them with varying method, levels of, uh, of humanity. Um, and uh, and uh, they were, uh, people, the interrogation uh, often didn't produce valuable intelligence. Um, and so we made the decision after 9-11 that this was too important to outsource and that we needed to do it ourselves, both for, in order to uh, ensure that, uh, that the, uh, the techniques were not uh, the same that might be used by the Egyptian military or other countries, um, and also to make sure that the ter interrogations were effective. Uh, and also to make sure, because part of one of the most important things about interrogation is being able to expose intelligence that you don't want to get out to the person who's being interrogated in order to get more information. And uh, you can't do that if they're in the custody of a foreign intelligence service uh, because of the danger of that information getting out. Okay. Uh, lots of uh, rich uh, analysis on the uh, floor. Uh, let's open it up. Let me know. And uh, just wait for a microphone to introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Keep it short, and we'll try to keep our answers b brief, and we'll get as many people in as we can. Earl Carr, thank you. Um, I was curious to know that no one mentioned the, um, the International Criminal Court as a, as, a, as a viable option. I'd be curious to know what your views on that are. Um, and kind of related to that question, I, I believe it was Mark, you mentioned that there's mm -hmm. kind of um, some hidden, uh, if an enemy, enemy combatant is um, caught, that there is some hidden rule that the crimes that they committed on the battlefield would be kind of absolved. Who, who determines that, and, and, and where did that come, come from? I don't think it's that the crimes that they committed on the battlefield are, are absolved. Is that if you capture somebody, I mean, in our view, in the, when, we, when we've switched, made a very conscious decision at the start of the Bush administration after 9-11 from the law enforcement approach to, to terrorism that, had, that the Clinton administration had followed to an intelligence and military driven uh, approach, uh, your first goal is to get intelligence as quickly as possible on pending attacks. Um, so, you're, you're, whereas if you're a, a interrogating someone from a law enforcement perspective, your goal is to get uh, is to get evidence that you can use and that can be preserved uh, to be used in a criminal trial to put, to punish that person for what they did. We were less concerned with punishing them than we were with getting intelligence to stop future attacks, and so that allows both a uh, b both for a broader array of techniques for interrogation and conditions for interrogation. And then afterwards, if you want to try them, you give up, you might have to give up the use of some of that information that you got for intelligence purposes for a criminal trial. So it's not that they're absolved of it, but that's not your primary concern so uh, going forward. That may have been my comment on combatant immunity, which is a pr principle in international law in a law of armed conflict that, you know, if you're a U.S. soldier fighting World War II and you kill Germans, the German courts are not going to haul you in and prosecute you for murder. You're a lawful combatant doing your job in wartime. Um, but I mean, I, I can't let that go unchallenged. You know, sure. go the ahead. jury's still out on the efficacy of our own interrogation programs. I think I'm anxious to read the Sissy report when it comes out. Um, my own experience as government left me very skeptical of the value of these programs, particularly as um, we've kept folks in detention for so long and the value of other programs have gone up. Our SIGINT, uh, the, the NSA programs that we've read about so much in the papers are dramatically more effective now than they were 12 years ago. Um, they may be a better arrow in our quiver now today. Um, and then the last thing is you, you mentioned this divide on the battlefield. Again, going back to my experiences in government, including on the battlefield, mm -hmm. um, you, you minimize the role that uh, forensics and intelligence collection and data collection and exploitation plays in today's soft world. And it's arguably the case that the special operators in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere do a better job of forensic collection and exploitation than the NYPD, and we ought to get the benefits of that, too. Let me just, uh, Matt, what about the ICC? Does it have any role? Right? Well, uh, the ICC has very limited, the International Criminal Court has very limited jurisdiction that doesn't really apply, I think, in the, in, in, in the case of these particular individuals, I think even if you were to try to come up with an international tribunal as a, as a mechanism for dealing with it, um, you, you probably end up with um, uh, uh, similar kinds of gross inefficiencies and capacity problems that have, uh, that, that, that have plagued some of the other uh, uh, processes. Okay, let's get some more. Uh, Jim Zirin. Thank you very much. You need a microphone. I need a microphone. Thank you. Uh, 
putting aside for the moment uh, 149 of the 150, uh, you have the poster child, a case in point. Khalil Sheikh Mohammed was the architect, allegedly, of the 9-11 conspiracy. Certainly, if the charges are true, the worst of the worst. And we considered trying him in a civilian court. And Obama, at the end, tilted in favor of the military tribunal on the premise that it would be too expensive and too difficult to provide security for the trial in the Southern District of New York. Now, that's, of course, debatable because he might have been tried in Governor's Island or in an Air Force base or in a military base within the Southern District of New York where really the crime occurred. So my question is, was this a wise decision uh, and on the part of the government? And really, wasn't uh, the civilian court the preferable tribunal? We have uh, 225 years of established jurisprudence. And now you're going to have a uh, military uh, trial with all sorts of improvised rules, which may or may not comport with due process of law. He'll be sentenced to life imprisonment or death. Uh, there'll be appellate litigation over the processes that were involved in the trial. And then uh, it'll be a subject of international debate forever as to whether we comported with international norms of uh, human rights in conducting a trial of this kind. Uh, wouldn't we have been far better off in relying on the civilian court in this case, and probably in a lot of the other cases of the 149 who are under detention. Very much like I, can, I think two people might agree with you here, and uh, <laughs> one might not. So, uh, but uh, you, know, you go to the not or the degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer in short is no, I disagree with that. Uh, n number one, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, before, the, before the, first of all, the Obama administration, in fact, did announce that they were going to try uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in mm -hmm. New York and was under intense backlash both from people here in the New York City and from people across the country uh, about that, that they backtracked on it and gave the, the justifications that you cited, uh, but their initial instinct was to try him uh, here in New York. Um, the, the fact is that before they announced that decision, when, when, uh, when, uh, when President Obama came into office, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had offered to plead guilty and go proceed straight to execution. Now, there's arguments whether or not under the, under the uh, uh, military commission process that could have been accepted, um, but he was ready to go straight to, to the execution and become a martyr uh, and all the rest, and he would have done it without uh, having the platform of trial in New York City to do it. Um, the fact is, if you bring Khalid Sheikh Mohammed here to New York, what, what is a trial for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? It's a propaganda tool. It's an opportunity for him to stand up on his soapbox and rally jihadists from around the world after, after having been captured, uh, taken uh, to a CIA site for a period of time, disappeared there, brought into a city of Guantanamo, also out of their sight, to emerge in flowing robes, uh, as strong as he ever was, uh, to preach the, the uh, jihad in, in, in an American courtroom in front of the international media, uh, and use that trial uh, as, a, as a recruiting tool, if you want to talk about a recruiting tool, uh, the recruiting tool for, uh, for al-Qaeda, uh, when we can simply try him under a process that also has over 235 years of precedent, because George Washington used military commissions, um, the, and, and uh, under rules that will not allow him to have that platform uh, in the greatest media market in the world and have a just trial and, a, uh, and uh, hopefully a conviction. So, so I disagree. I mean, law is a tool of the strong. It's a tool of the government. It would be a propaganda event, but for us, it would be an example of where our system is stronger than he is and a chance to give New Yorkers the justice they, deliver, they deserve. Um, I think the best policy outcome in this case is not a military commission that came, seems to stop every three months at any procedural obstacle, but it's a speedy, swift trial in federal court that delivers KSM to a prison in Florence, Colorado for the rest of his life and never to be heard from again. Uh, yes, ma'am, at the second table here. We can probably get you a microphone fairly quickly. The traffic allows. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Cora Weiss. Um, I'd like to follow up on that question and on your answers. Mm -hmm. I gather, uh, either today or yesterday, I don't have the date, that Major Jason Wright, who was on the defense team of Sheikh Mohammed, mm -hmm. uh, is resigning from the Army and is accusing the Army of trying to force him to leave the defense after he has spent three years on it. And he's claiming that the military commissions are broken. Can you comment on that and let us know what's going on? Well, and I mean, where is Muhammad going to get an, another lawyer? 
Well, let me just sort of follow up on that. Why, if military commissions were first established by George Washington, why is it such a, an ineffective or such still such a, why are we forced to improvise 235 years later uh, with military commissions? Why aren't they, if you will, more finely honed and oiled? So it's an ad hoc tool that is constituted by the convening authority at each moment. The Continental Army did so, uh, General Winfield Scott does so in the Mexican War, you see them in the Civil War, you see them again at various periods of conflict. These ones came into being in 2001, they've been modified a series of times since then, but they're still in their infancy relative to other systems of justice. Right. And, and they've been challenged by, by people who oppose them and who have wrapped them in procedural, uh, in procedural hurdles as well. Mm -hmm. um, they were, there was also for a long time in the Bush administration, there was a, there, it, it took a Supreme Court decision before the, they were released to, 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 to go forward. So it, it's been, uh, it's been, a, a, it's been tied, it's, it's like saying your system doesn't work because the people who oppose your system have tied it in knots and so therefore we should just go back to the system that the opponents want. It, 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 the, the, the hurdles are, are becoming un, uh, as the hurdles are removed, the, pro the process can go forward. But basically, people are, are coming up with their, with their uh, goal, which is to tie up the military commissions in knots and then saying, you see, the, the commissions don't work. Uh, we need to go to civilian trials. Matthew, you want to wait? I, I, well, I, one, one point I would just add, I, I mean, it's important to, to keep in mind, the military commissions that are currently being conducted now uh, uh, were established by the Democratic-controlled Congress and uh, uh, endorsed by the current Democratic president, Democratic Party president. Uh, they face a big challenge, though, in that uh, uh, they got off on a very bad foot during the Bush administration. I think the uh, process for establishing them was rushed through in a way that was not fully vetted. Uh, 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 and uh, they, they very quickly acquired, whether justified or not, they acquired a very sticky reputation internationally for having been uh, uh, created as a shortcut of, of justice and especially a way of shielding from public view uh, 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 abusive interrogations and, and, and things like that. That reputation, uh, uh, whether justifiably or not, has stuck. And so I think continuing with military commissions does uh, 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 contain this uh, 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 this uh, uh, sort of public relations cost that's going to be very, very, very <laughs> difficult to get out of. One uh, uh, point I would just add, it is a point that I thought of in, in Jim Zirin's uh, uh, question, you know, uh, and the administration ought to be thinking ahead several steps as it, as it decides what to do with remaining detainees at, at Guantanamo. One thing that the administration has not talked about, I, there are good reasons why it doesn't want to, um, but if it is worried about propaganda value of, of Guantanamo, one interesting, uh, I, I think, very likely scenario, if the administration goes through with either criminal trials in civilian courts or military commissions, is that it is likely to sentence to death um, some of the uh, uh, detainees at Guantanamo. If you're worried about Guantanamo now being a propaganda and recruitment tool, uh, and you're worried about now Guantanamo being a source of friction uh, uh, with our European allies, most of whom regard the death penalty as barbaric and illegal, um, wait till we start executing some of the detainees. Does anyone have any comments on the specifics of that last question about this individual? As a former Army officer, never underestimate the capacity of the military personnel system to get something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we can, uh, yes, sir. Hello, my name is Ivan Rodello. I wanted to ask, uh, from your vantage point, uh, the governments of Colombia and Uruguay have recently announced that the United States has asked them to take in Guantanamo detainees. Uh, why would these two countries be selected, and which prison, uh, what would be the process of deciding which prisoners are released to which countries? I understand Colombia has yet to decide, and Uruguay has already accepted. Uh, this was something that I worked on a bit in, in government. The short answer is uh, if we can find other countries who are willing to take detainees off of our hands with sufficient assurances, and as Richard said, there are really two sets of assurances that are important. One is adequate security assurances, and the other is adequate humane treatment assurances. But it's long been the policy of the Bush administration and now Obama administration that for many of the detainees, not all of them, but for many of them, if we can find some other 
country to take them off our hands and we can coax them diplomatically or with other carrots to do so, uh, great. Um, and you're right, I mean, some of, these, some of these particular destinations have no particular relationship to the war against Al Qaeda. They just may be the ones willing to do it. Though I assume that's for the Uyghurs. So these are people who have been found in, in some cases. not to be a threat, whether you agree with no, that or not, but, that, but they can't be sent back to China for no, fear of persecution. I mean, there's a much broader category. I think it was 70 people identified at last mm -hmm. count where uh, Special Envoy Cliff Sloan, formerly Dan Freed, were going around the world trying to convince countries to take these folks. And for a variety of reasons, they determine it's in their interest to do so, usually as part of a broader package of counter-terrorist carrots and mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. I'd like to ask the panelists, um, do you think uh, most of the detainees, or all of them, could be released when um, Afghanistan war ends this December? Why or why not? Just to be clear, the Afghanistan war, uh, there's, no there's no date by which the war ends. Uh, what will at some point happen is uh, U.S. troops will draw down, I believe, and will negotiate a uh, status of forces agreement of some sort or another with the successor government. Uh, but I would unfortunately expect a conflict in Afghanistan to continue uh, for years, if not decades, to come. What I don't know is the specific level of the uh, conflict. Yeah. But, I think that's right. But this is the $64,000 question in this space. For some of the detainees who were captured on the battlefield in, Iraq, um, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, um, their detention may be suspect. And the next time they go to federal court on a habeas petition, uh, they may prevail. Um, Justice Kennedy? No. Uh, uh, Breyer, in oh. a dissenting opinion from a cert denial, which, sorry for the legal gobbledygook, essentially fired a shot across the administration's bow this week, saying, if you think the AUMF, the authorization for the use of military force that has justified detention to this point, no. will continue ad infinitum and continue after the wars, you might want to rethink that. I think the administration is at least convinced as to a few of the detainees that their detentions can't be justified beyond the end of our involvement in Afghanistan. Understood. Okay, misunderstood the yeah. question. And, and I would just add, you know, I, I think as we think about uh, options for the way forward, it's important to think about possible sort of game-changing uh, 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 intervening factors. One possible intervening factor is that uh, uh, the drawdown of U.S. combat forces in Afghanistan could give rise to new legal arguments on behalf of detainees at Guantanamo. Uh, uh, the executive branch has been surprised before with the, uh, uh, the kinds of holdings uh, 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 that uh, uh, judges have come back with in, uh, in the detention cases. And uh, 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 litigation and results of, of litigation could also be a prompt for Congress to revisit some of the, uh, uh, some of the existing detention authorities that the executive but, branch is relying on. But it's worth noting the AUMF is broader than the wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That war, that shadow war against al-Qaeda will likely yeah. continue outside of those countries. Absolutely. And we, we will go into uncharted waters at that point to test the detentions of all of the other detainees that are not directly connected to the battlefields of well, this place. And that's, that certainly has been the executive branch's argument to this point that it has prevailed on again and again uh, 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 in courts. I, I think the question is whether you get further and further from 9-11, uh, are federal judges going to be increasingly skeptical of that argument? That's, a, that's, a, that's an open question, but a, a possible intervening factor in this. So let me just sort of bring it to a close then with two last questions. One is, here we are, President Obama has two and three quarters years to go in his second term. Do any of you believe that at the end of that second term, Guantanamo uh, will be closed? No. No. Maybe. No. <laughs> Not a chance. Uh, <laughs> and if that were the case, assume that the, the two and a half uh, votes that it would not be closed by then. So here, imagine then it's now early 2017, and the 45th president of the United States uh, takes office, and you were called in to make a recommendation to the 25th pre to the 45th president about uh, what to do about Guantanamo. What is it you would recommend? 
Let's go. I'll start the opposite way. Matt. Well, I mean, I, I think my advice to the remainder of President uh, Obama's term and to the next president would be um, uh, you need to make, there, there, there really is a, a, a fish or cut bait kind of choice to be made. And it doesn't make sense uh, any longer to continue to just make speeches declaring an intention to close Guantanamo. If you want to do it, uh, 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 you need to A, come up with a comprehensive plan for doing so that you can defend to Congress and, and the American people, and B, uh, 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 be willing to spend a good deal of political capital to do so. I haven't seen either of those two things from the uh, Obama administration. The alternative, or an alternative, is you can continue with the status quo. Uh, I, 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 I would uh, I, I, I strongly support uh, using some political capital to, to, um, uh, to defend, as I said before, a range of tools. Some detainees would be held as enemy belligerents uh, 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 captured in an ongoing armed conflict. Some might be prosecuted through military commissions. Some should be brought to uh, a, a criminal trial. Uh, I, I assume one point that, uh, 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 that Marx is going to get to uh, that I think any president also needs to confront is we shouldn't just think about the detention problem, the Guantanamo problem, as dealing with the 150 people who remain there now. We will continue to face the possibility of and likelihood of taking custody of al-Qaeda suspects in the future, and we don't yet have a clear and sustainable policy for how we're going to deal with them. Sure. My advice to the next president of the United States would be use it. Uh, the purpose of Guantanamo Bay uh, from the initial was not to be a detention center, it was to be a strategic interrogation center. Uh, because, as John Rumsfeld said at the time, it's the least worst place. There's lots of problems with Guantanamo Bay, but it's the least worst place. There's no alternative, and here we are uh, three quarters of the way, two thirds of the way through the Obama administration, and he hasn't come up with an alternative. Uh, we, are, we are killing terrorists rather than capturing them, and we're killing them because we have nowhere to take them. Uh, in, the, in the six and a half years the pre or so that President Obama has been in office, uh, we have captured exactly two senior al-Qaeda leaders. Five and a half. I'm sorry, five and a half. Uh, we've captured exactly two senior al-Qaeda leaders and not killed them with drones and, and taken them into custody. Uh, we, we, they were both put for brief periods of time on a Navy ship, uh, which uh, just a uh, former CIA director Mike Hayden calls a gray site, uh, as opposed to a black site, um, and uh, and <laughs> because then the paint brought, color, and then brought into uh, brought to New York for uh, for trial in the criminal justice system. The last one was Anas al Libby, who's a senior Al Qaeda leader captured in in Libya. He was put on a ship for one week and then brought into the criminal justice system. Even if he was spilling his guts. There is no possible way you could exploit everything that he knows. This is a guy who had been with bin Laden and Zawahiri from the, in Sudan in the 1990s through Afghanistan. Uh, he was in Tehran, uh, so he knows about the, that, that, the Al Qaeda's operations there. An absolute treasure trove of information. If he was spilling his guts, you couldn't get everything he knows in one week. So we are vaporizing intelligence. And this administration has dined out on the, as much as they criticized the Bush administration, to this day they're using the intelligence produced by the CIA interrogation program. They're using the intelligence produced by detainees in Guantanamo Bay. They're just not replenishing it. So the next president's going to come in without the benefit of all the intelligence that was produced from detainee interrogations uh, under his predecessor the way Obama did. We need to stop killing terrorists. We need to start capturing them. And we need a place to put them. And the least worst place to do that is Guantanamo Bay. Mr. Carter. Well, I'm not, I'm not so uh, down on our intelligence collection right now. I think it's still pretty robust. But um, I think I'd ask two questions. One, what party are you from, <laughs> Mr. or Mrs. President, in 2017? Because that's going to make a difference in who's in Congress. And two, at that point in time, does the risk of keeping Guantanamo open with all that entails um, justify, I'm sorry, is the risk of transfer or release greater or less than the risk of keeping it open. Um, I think we've crossed a tipping you point mean now. risk or you mean cost of keeping it open? Yes. There's not a risk of keeping it open, right. a potential cost. Um, I think we've crossed a tipping point now where we are spending more to keep that place open in dollars and costs, et cetera. And we're heading towards a Rudolph Hess problem, where in 5, 10, 20 years, we're going to get down to such a small detainee population for such a large facility that's not accomplishing anything for us and we ultimately need to close it because we can't afford to keep that open. This reminds me, when I used to teach at the Kennedy School, I used to tell uh, the students there, uh, the foreign policy students, that foreign policy is hard. 
Uh, <laughs> the analysis is hard to think it through and then to think about implementation. And this to me, if I were still teaching, I would use this as a case from uh, the decision early on, people to, to close it without necessarily thinking through how you actually go about the implementation of it. And here we are five plus years later. And if I, I actually agree, I think in two and a half, three years, the, the next president of the United States will inherit this situation. And again, the choosing amongst, shall we say, uh, difficult options, none of which is a cost or risk-free, is likely to remain the uh, reality. I want to thank uh, these three individuals for uh, walking us through uh, an important and difficult set of issues.